We got a lot of folks in the house. Make sure your seatbelt's fastened. Okay, I think we better get our startup song going. You are allowed to snap your fingers this morning. Oh, there we go, folks. Love this song. Don't open champagne, not yet. Oh yeah, we're at my house. Where have you been, people? Quarantine. Here we go. You now know where I live. Oh yeah. Hey, hey. Welcome, Welcome to my house. house. Baby, take control now. We can't even slow down. We don't have to go home. Here we go. We're going to play it loud today. Oh, come on in. You're at my house. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Kim Sutton. And I am thrilled to be doing some sessions that are free, that we can just kind of explore some mathematics. Um, some of you know my favorite big connection is to connect math and literature. And I always do this with my students at the beginning of the year. We have a conversation and I'm going to do it with you because I have always loved what comes out of this conversation. Oh, present, present on the screen. Here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about this analogy this morning. Literature is like a gift because... Close your eyes for a minute and think about that. As I sweep off my screen here from all of its little scrap paper from all my other sessions. Literature is like a gift because... Anybody think of the reason you can't wait to open it and see what's inside. Here's the thing about it. It is like a gift. You get a book and you just can't wait. I've got one on my list that I keep moving further and further up my list because I just can't wait to read it. Here's the thing. That is a profound analogy. That's what we bring to elementary students, and we bring it with all our heart every time we read a book. All right, put that to the side. Close your eyes for a second. Open them up. Different analogy. Mathematics is like a gift because... Here's one of my students. He goes, Miss Sutton, sometimes you feel like returning it. I thought that was so funny. <laughs> Here's the thing, people. I always have a mission with students to make them connect what they feel when they read a good book to the mathematics we do in class. And the best, most powerful way to do that is by picking out books that are math literature books that help children make that connection. Now, if you've been at classes with me before, which an awful lot of you have, you know that in the handout that I provide for you, I always provide a bibliography. And it is an ongoing work for me. I have my big, 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 big bibliography on my website. 
And um, I try to update it once a month. I'm behind by a couple of months here, but I'll get it updated this week. But the handout for today, if you have not downloaded it, it is really simple. I didn't want to overwhelm us because in a short session, it's not like I can do all of these books and it's not even like I can read all of the books. I will try to share a lot of books with you this session. And I intentionally, my husband asked the big question when I was planning for this, he goes, are they all new books? A lot of them are new books. A lot of them are. A lot of them are classic books, but I wanted to bring a mix to you about how I use them with children. I'm gonna start off this morning, and I, again, I will just make a little mark by the books that I choose to talk about. Doesn't mean I'm going in order of this. Your bibliography is done by a mathematician, me. So if you notice our sections, you will see that I alphabetized by the author's last name, but within the context of the section. So you have a general math section, counting books with a twist. And if you've been with me before, you know I love counting books, even with seventh and eighth graders, telling time, place value, number sense, money, addition, subtraction, skip counting by multiples, multiplication and division, fractional relationships, algebraic thinking, measurement, geometry, probability, and statistics. Now, the big bibliography on my website, I think is currently 47 pages long. So it's massive. And some people think I put it up there because I'm suggesting that you buy all those books. Not making that suggestion, people. I think it's a good document to see what books we have within our library. I'm also going to tell you that one of my local teachers, Quincy Hawkins Brownfield, when we went out on this great COVID adventure, uh, she said, she reached out and she goes, you know what, I know you're trying to figure out what you could do to help us. And I said, yeah, I actually am Quincy. And she said, you have the biggest math literature collection of anyone I know i.e. look over my shoulder, I have books here, I have books on the floor, I have books on the other side of this table, I have a lot of books. She said, why don't you choose to read some of your books and post the reading on your YouTube channel? And I thought, oh my gosh, good idea. She goes, you know, we didn't have time to grab books and make those connections. So what I did during COVID times is I did read a lot of books. Here's the funny part. And those of you that know me are gonna say, yeah, this is a story of Kim Sutton's life. My timing sometimes is so ridiculous. So I decided to read books out loud the same week that Michelle Obama started reading literature books to children. <laughs> And the same week that Jennifer Gardner did. And I thought, what, do I think I'm like them? I don't, people. Here's the good news, though. They didn't read any math literature books. So I will point out which books are currently on my website. It looks like I will continue that practice throughout the school year. So I'll try to post a reading at least once a week where I actually read and use my document camera. So I'm gonna start this morning with a book and it is listed second on your list. And this is one of those crazy books that I just love. It reminds me a lot of the math curse for those of you that have been around a while. And it's, I'm trying to love math. And this author also did an amazing book that, here you go, Robin, here's your science. I'm trying to love spiders. So I'll put the books up. If you did not download that bibliography, don't worry, just sit back and enjoy the book. You can always re-watch this. Um, this is a fun book. I also am one of these people 
And it comes partly because my daughter is a writer and her first book was supposed to be out the last week of July. It is called The Lady Upstairs, but it has been postponed until November because of COVID. And um, I just want to mention that because it's a great read. It's like one of those books that you start and you can't put down. So this author chose to have some meaning in uh, what children would see. Mathematics, in a sense, is logic let loose in a field of imagination. Ah, I'm trying to love math. If you ask me, math is not very lovable. What do you see, class? A traditional approach to mathematics. Now, I know you know that we're not doing that, but we still have children with that that carry around that anxiety. I know I'm not alone here either. Four in 10 Americans hate math. That's like 40%. Did you just use math to explain how much you don't like it? <laughs> if you watched a couple of my sessions, I did a session on how to convert data from a bar graph into a circle graph. So there's a little piece you can add in. A space alien, what do you know about math? Well, math is understood all over the earth, no matter what language people speak. That's why math is called the universal language. Except you're not from earth. Nope, but thankfully scientists sent math out to space. Scientists took examples of life on earth, things like language, music, and math, and put them onto golden records. The golden records went on space probes they sent into deep space for curious aliens like me to find. They sent you math? No wonder aliens don't come visit. They should have sent cookies. What are cookies? I'll make you some. They're so much better than math. Now, the book is just filled with connections of math to the real world. So, you can get very playful with this book with children. There is a power in talking about the anxiety that some people feel about math. And I'm not sure that that's a solvable problem, but you know what? We try every day to make it a solvable problem. You can see as you go through the book, very simple presentation of mathematics to students. I love this book. I've had a lot of fun since it came out using it in classrooms. I think you'll enjoy the book too. And remember, I'm just going to give you little samplers of books today, just so you can feel like you've caught up on some of the most current literature. So, I'm going to share some books with you now that are in that general section. And I, I've been very excited about some of these books because, first of all, you are going to see that the books I just put check marks by are about children who did love math who went on to do great things in math. So there is a book at the top of your list called Nothing Stopped Sophie. Again, when I was having the conversation with Robin, first thing she was talking about science, virtual science. Here's the thing. The books I'm gonna feature in this section are books that quite honestly bring that idea of equity in gender. They bring the idea of cultural diversity. And they also connect to the history of mathematics. So this is about the mathematician Sophie Germain. And Sophie Germain has quite a backstory. 
to her mathematics not current, this is historical. So you are looking at a story about a female at a time in history where females were not encouraged to be mathematicians, but nothing stopped this female. I love this line, telling Sophie not to think about math was like telling a bird not to soar. Isn't that great? I just love the use of the analogy there. And again, I'm going to share with you parts of books, part of the illustrations, not be able to read all of them to you. But what you will find at all the books in this section that are historical in nature, you will see as the story progresses that in the back, you will find a history of Sophie Germain and her effects on studying vibration as a mathematician scientist. And all of her work is used currently today. So I love this connection. There is also a strong connection for those of you that talk about Archimedes with your students. There's a strong connection to that. Great book. Great read aloud with students, great way to introduce perhaps some research about males and females that went on to do mathematics. Again, I'm just giving you a quick look at some of these books. Some of them I will read a little more thoroughly. Most people watch the special about Dr. Temple Grandin. Here's the thing, this is a children's book about her, the girl who thought in pictures. I love this book because the mathematics that we're trying to get across to students is the idea that you can picture mathematics if you truly understand it. And this is a great lead in to the idea of talking about those pictures in your mind's eye that children can create from the concepts that we teach. Now, keep that in mind because in a little while, I'll talk about a book that allows us to picture multiplication and picture division. In this same series, The Girl with a Mind for Math is a story of an Arkansas little girl who um, grew up again, with a passion for mathematics and engineering. And her name is Ray Montague. And her work has been extremely profound in mathematics. Again, great read aloud. Oh, gosh, look, submarines. Oh, I wonder if there's going to be something interesting. If there's something you want, but it seems out of reach, here's a story for you. A great truth it will teach. Teacher pauses. That is profound. When you focus your mind, you'll succeed through and through, like one bold engineer by the name Montag. In a state we call Arkansas one winter day, a baby was welcomed, a girl they called Ray. She was bright as a star, super smart from the start. She was headstrong, this child, and not faint of heart. Yes, this girl had potential. Her granddad was proud. He told her, work hard. You'll stand out from the crowd. Then something she cherished when Ray was just seven, he took her to see her first ship. It was heaven. Oh, do you love that? Give me a smile, people. Some of you look so serious this morning. <laughs> A real submarine, her eyes opened wide. Who made it, she asked, as they followed the guide. Engineers, said the man, giving Ray's head a pat. But my dear, you don't need to know all about that. At the time, the man's insult went over her head. No, you can't, were the words he meant, but not said. Love this for gender equity.
Engineering, thought Ray, and her life stream became, except most people laughed when she told them her plan. Stay strong, said her mom. Use your brains. You'll be fine. There will always be people who pay you no mind. Just because you're a girl and because you are black, don't let them or the state of your school hold you back. Might make a recommendation to listen to the keynote speech at the virtual um, mass summit that Christine has been putting on because he talks a lot about all of us being a little more enlightened on these current issues. You see school in those days were what's called segregated. The black and white students were kept separated. That's wrong, you explain. It was dismal, no fooling. And worst of all, white kids received better schooling. But Ray studied hard. She had grit, taught herself. She was gifted in math and read books by the shelf. When the time for college, excuse me, when the time came for college, she knew what to choose. She'd learned to build boats, but she got some bad news. Engineering's not taught to black students, they said. Her heart hit the floor. I'll take business instead. She learned what she could, and she'd learn the rest later. Their rules were unjust, but that school wouldn't break her. Now, you can tell this is going to go deep into those issues that we're all dealing with currently. I love the story because she does have a remarkable history with the Navy and design of submarines. And I love the book because it's quite encouraging for children that get passed over. Here's the thing about this. You can find out an awful lot about Ray. And there's a timeline of her life. She only recently passed away in 2018, but made quite a mark for women in mathematics and also for cultural diversity in mathematics. Love the book, love the simplicity of the text. You know I would have to bring in this one. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because most of us have seen the movie Hidden Figures. And again, if you're a reader yourself, which most of us are as teachers, I would highly encourage the reading of the actual book, Hidden Figures, because as always in a movie, they kind of gloss over big ideas. In the adult read, Hidden Figures, you actually figure out how Catherine was responsible for changing rounding rules. So, Here's the thing about this book. This is the story of Katherine Johnson. Again, told from a child's perspective. And the nice thing about the book is I love the book with children when you are teaching rounding rules because she changed how we teach rounding. Oh, that's right except for elementary. We're stuck in the old rounding rules. Watch my fingers. Oh, that's right. I talked about this on Monday at my class called Critical Math Tools. The rule is we round up on, watch my fingers, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We round down on one, two, three, four. Anybody see an issue? Yeah, that's the problem. But she talked, she changed things because uh, NASA was using that kind of rounding. And because of those rounding rules, you end up rounding up more frequently than you round down. Great book, great story, again, of a child who had to overcome a lot of obstacles on her journey 
to greatness. And if you watch the movie, you certainly know this story. But again, what you will see at the end of the book is more information about her as a female and a woman of color and why her contributions were so significant to the scientific world. So those are some bu books. Oh, wait, it looks like I only have female books. No, no. I don't know if you know the story of Paul Erdos, but quite an amazing story. And I don't want you to think I only pick female books. Um, I'm a little more <laughs> slanted towards that because of my own history in mathematics. But this is an interesting story about a young man who went on to have a very interesting life in mathematics. Oh, that's right. I need to tell you. On the spectrum, Asperger's, whole bunch of issues, but fell in love with math and really made it his life work, even though to tell you it wasn't profitable for him is exactly the truth. But he took a passion that he discovered and um, really, really made quite a contribution, even though he himself had to overcome a lot of issues. And I, I love the story with children because you will see children make connections to um, his issues. And um, I don't know, it, it feels comforting when you read it with children. Great book. Some of these books will be in the Scholastic Book Order this year. And you will see that progression. And I'll try to talk about that. I will try to feature a mathematician every ma month and give you some activities that go with these things, which I did at the end of the year. So that is a great book to use with students. I also wanted to point out in this section, <laughs> I think this is funny. This book, Eat Your Math Homework, I laughed so hard when this came out at my own limited mind. So the book came out and I thought to myself, oh my God, if I see one more book, because those of you that know me know I've been in education now 45 years. And I've seen a lot of books where someone will say, oh, take Cheerios and count Cheerios. And I'm like, okay, has to go deeper than that. So I had this mindset, oh God, not another book that has limited mathematics. And then I cracked the spine on this. Oh, Fibonacci snack sticks? You're kidding me. And I thought this year where we are caught up, so many of us in virtual teaching, that this might be a way to take, again, it's not a literature story, nonfiction, but talk about Oh, here we might talk about Fibonacci. You're going to see some pattern work. And if you attended a class with me earlier this summer, I did an awful lot of algebraic T tables. So the book does some amazing things in talking about mathematics. Um, also, when I turn to this section on the fraction chips, I just want to mention, Tomorrow at my freebie, which is a make it, take it, I will show you how to make an at-home fraction kit with your students without having to sort manipulatives. But the book has some real depth in what we're asking children to do. I love the tessellation section. So this is not your average book about using food in math. This is a little higher level. So this one will be in the Scholastic Book Order. And I just thought I'd mention it again as a possibility to build on again this year with. I also want you to note on your handout that some books have a little asterisk by them. 
and I need to tell you what that is. Someone asked me recently, if you were only going to own 10 books, what would be the 10 math books you would own? And I, I thought that was an absolutely great question. Of course, then later, somebody put out on Facebook, if you were only going to buy from iTunes 10 songs, what would the songs be? And I thought, oh, oh, okay. So I put a little asterisk. If you have a limited budget, this book will always be one of my absolute favorite books in math. If you've been to workshops with me where you have made my math dictionary, you'll see a parallel to this. Also, I will be doing some work this year on uh, short after school sessions. One of them will be a session about my six guiding principles. And I always go back to thanking Marcy Cook for planting this seed in my head because years ago she said to me, Kim, the language of mathematics is spoken here. And I was like, oh, you mean here in our classrooms? And, I, and she said, yeah, absolutely. I love David Schwartz's book. Remember, this book has been out a while. It is what I would call a classic. Um, I like it. I love alphabet books. Again, like counting books, I'm always looking for a big twist to the story. So when David Schwartz wrote this book, I got a sample copy of it in the mail. And this is my approach to new books. I'm flipping through, I'm flipping through, I'm flipping through. I'm like so excited about the topics here. I mean, I love the if, because many of you know I use if then statements with children. I mean, I was flipping through here and I'm like so excited. And then I hit this page and my little math heart sank. Oh, that's right. I've seen David Schwartz many times in person at math conferences. He has a great sense of humor. So all of a sudden I kept reading and he says, diamonds shouldn't be in this book. There are diamonds in rings, there are diamonds on baseball fields, but there are no diamonds in math. I love that because he is saying that's not a math term. Some of you know that I have a thing about this because of teaching upper grades and having children having limited access to language. Here's the thing, people. It just takes us speaking the language. This is a great invitation into the language of mathematics. He goes into this with a sense of humor. He goes into this with the idea of how we can build a bank of language. Would you make a note next to this book title? On my website in the free section, I went through all the standards that are used in North America by grade level and I made a list of math vocabulary that you need to cover in a given year. Now, please don't misinterpret my mission there. I did not put it on my website so you would download it and send it home with students. I put it there because I honestly think that we have to be more intentional. Oh, that's right, because of virtual instruction, more intentional with our math language. I have a session coming up in September on the language of mathematics, and you will read about it on my website very soon. So I have a lot of things planned for this year to hopefully help you. Put five stars next to that book. That is an absolute classic in my mind. And if I were gonna limit my list to only 10 bucks, that would be one of the 10. You will also see in that section, my friend Greg Tang's books with Greg um, doing an awful lot this summer too.
His books are very profound for mathematics. I'm going to talk about a few counting books with you. And honestly, my husband is on the chat. He is not physically in the same spot I am. He is at Creative Mathematics with a much weaker internet than I have at my house. So if you need to ask any questions, ask any questions or unmute yourself because I had uh, so many great questions this summer that revolved around books. If you have a request for a book to go with a concept you're teaching, reach out to me, people. I had a group of 40 kindergarten teachers in Ohio earlier this summer, and one of them said, how do you introduce subtraction? And with kindergarten, and I go, okay, two books. So I'm going to talk about these books, but I want to get into some counting books. And if you were with me for my Just Kindergarten Math series, you met one of the books. This is not a new book. This is by Donald Cruz. If you use a 10 frame, with children. I like the book a lot to introduce 10 frames because what I gave my students were some stick on dots. I gave them an empty 10 frame and as the book brought up different quantities, we added it to our 10 frame. What can you do with 10 black dots? One dot can make a sun or a moon when day is done. Two dots can make the eyes of a fox or the eyes of keys that open locks. Three dots can make a snowman's face or beads for stringing on a lace. Remember my counting rope, if you were with me. Great way to talk about the counting rope. Four dots can make seeds from which flowers grow or the knobs on a radio. What's a radio, Miss Sutton? <laughs> Five dots can make buttons on a coat or the portholes of a boat. Now you can see the potential here. Six dots can make marbles that you hold. Half are new, the rest are old. Seven dots can make the spots on a snake or stones turned up by a garden rake. Eight dots can make the wheels of a train carrying freight through sun and rain. Now, this is an old book. I consider it a classic counting book. Great way to bring the 10 frame to life. Now, in that same list, you will see, and I featured this one at my kindergarten um, Just Math series, a new book by Danica McKellar. Anybody recognize that name? Danica McKellar was Winnie on the Wonder Years. And I think a lot of people thought, oh, she's an actress. But what Danica McKellar is really known for in my book is she is actually quite a mathematician. So she took her passion for mathematics and she started writing not primary books first. Those of you that work with fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, check out her books for middle school kids. She tries to take hard concepts for middle school children and make them much easier to understand. But look at the radical change in her life. Then she had her own child, and all of a sudden she decided, I'm gonna write books as my own child grows. She has podcasts um, that are really great. Uh, she does live sessions. She's quite an amazing young woman. But what I liked about this book, 
also, I love to collect counting books, but before you actually even open the book, you will see before she starts writing the text, a lot of different, different representations. Oh, that's right, a 10 frame. And then a 10 frame made fun. So she gets very playful with her text and the simplicity of how she uses numbers. So check her out. I love what she has done so far. She's also written some teacher books and I'll put one of them on the screen very shortly. She also did a book called 10 Magic Butterflies. So again, you will see these books on my bibliography. So this book, I love the illustrations in it. Very captivating to students. What I think is great about it, again, you see the 10 frame brought to life here. Once upon a time, there were 10 flower friends. Were they always happy? Well, that depends. All day long, they soaked up the sun, talking and laughing and having fun. Oh, they really are laughing. They loved being flowers, but they couldn't deny that they had a secret desire to fly. They watched every eve as the fairies flew from the moonlit night to the morning dew. Then one starry night, a flower felt brave. She spotted a fairy and started to wave. Said the tiny blue one, fairy up in the sky, you see I'm a flower, but I want to fly. Hello there, my friend, you smile and you sing. Why would you want to be a different thing? I'm tired of being a flower just stuck on the ground. I want new adventures to zoom all around. The fairy shrugged, okay, and she closed her eyes. Time to get ready for a big surprise. With a wave of her wand and a bing, bang, boo, the fairy said, now you're a butterfly, Blue. Oh, Miss Sutton, I like those pictures. One butterfly flew as nine flowers looked on. There were still 10 of them in the sky on the lawn. This book is about the decomposition of that 10. Put a note to yourself. Again, connect it to the 10 frame, connect it to addition combinations that make a sum of 10 and subtraction facts where we decompose that 10. So the book goes on to get playful with different combinations that make a 10. Make a little note to yourself. I have that great card game called Take Two for 10, where children pick up combinations of 10. This is a great lead in to that book. I mean, to that card game. And again, you can check out me playing that card game on my YouTube channel, which is just Creative Mathematics. You'll also see in this section a book by, and oh my gosh, do I love this book. Yeah, this session's going to be 24 hours in length if I don't watch it. This is called One Fox. Now, before we went out on COVID, I got my copy shortly before that, and I went in a classroom and read the story, and this little boy goes, oh, Kate, read. I said, how'd you know the word Kate? And he said, oh, my sister's named Kate. And he was five, and I said, great, and you know the word read. And he goes, yeah, isn't that the most amazing thing that the author has the same name as what you want us to do? I said, yeah, those are called cheap thrills, people. You have to live for them because there is no 
screws at the end of this teaching profession. The best you can hope for is a career full of cheap thrills. Now, the suspense in this book just builds and builds. I love the dedication, and I always read dedications because my daughter is an author, to Ella, Alice, and Harriet, my fierce little chicks, and Jack, Ruth, and Rebecca, the best friends a girl could have. Oh, now you have an insight to the author. One famished fox. Uh oh. Two sly eyes. Oh, <laughs> scary, Miss Adam. Three plump hens. In that classroom, this little boy goes, is this going to end bad? I said, no. Four padding paws. Five snug eggs. Oh, look at those eggs. We can count those. Six silent steps. Oh, look at those steps. Seven knocks at the door. Oh no, the door into the hen house. Eight beady eyes. Oh, look at those eyes. Ooh. <laughs> Nine flying feathers. Ready? Ready? Oh no, Miss Sutton. Ten sharp teeth. Oh, you ready? You ready? One hundred angry hens. <laughs> Are you surprised? One frightened fox. Good story, wasn't it? And not long. Makes you talk a little bit about the suspense of writing. I also put a book in this section. And I'll tell you, these times, people, we have had to go back to some of our roots. So you can tell I have an awful lot of these wonderful puppets that I use with children. And again, kind of gotten away from it. But virtual teaching, you can see my puppet behind me for circumference books. Um, you'll see me use a sheep puppet. Again, these times ca cause us to think about how we can keep their interest going. This is the last accounting book that I'll talk about. My big, um, oh, my husband just said I need to zoom in more for the books. I'll try no, to- the other way. Is no, that the other way. The other way? Okay. Yes, zoom out gotcha. a little. That's as far as it goes, but thank you, my love. He's my conscience. Um, this is a great book because it offers the mindset, put a note of the thinking behind the reasoning for multiplicative thoughts. What I mean by that is the groups of. So when you hear me talk about that at my workshops, I'm talking about moving children from what is called additive reasoning to multiplicative reasoning. Hard word for me to say. This is a great book for that. Not necessarily a new book. It's been around for a while. Might be in your library. It also, is a great science book because it's going to give you some information. So we are counting feet in this story. You can see that we're going to compose, oh, that's right, two and one. As we go through the book, you'll see that thinking in groups of. So you're going to hit, again, 
Seven is an insect and a snail. Eight is a spider. Nine is a spider and a snail. Can you see the potential for writing equations using this? And look at our crab. Now, I happen to live in a place that makes me love Dungeness crab because we get it here right on the coast. Um, 10 is a great number for a crab, as you can see. So when you're thinking in groups of, you have the potential in this story to build that reasoning. So I love it. I also love it with my counting clothesline, those of you that have seen that, because on my eight t-shirt, I put the number of legs on a spider. So you can see that the book then talks about grouping of numbers. So you'll see an awful lot of math that can happen very, very simply with children. I also want to remind you how effective a oh yeah, egg carton can be for thinking in groups of. So children can actually use this to be building that idea of four groups of two and what does that look like? So I've been going back to my roots, people. My roots being things like egg cartons to build that thinking. I love this book because they're actually starting to think in groups of as a way to transition the thinking away from unit-based counting. You will also see that, I'll come back to the time books, but if you look under place value, for a long time, I really didn't have a lot of books for place value. And then my friend Stuart Murphy changed my life forever when he came out with the book, Earth Day Hooray. I want to mention that book. Put five stars next to it. I will also tell you, move it up to the top of your must-have books. The problem with Scholastic is they put this book in the March book order every year. Here's why that annoys me. I get it. Earth Day is in April. I get that part. But for me, place value is such a big concept to developing strong number sense that I really, really believe in children starting the year with the study of place value in the range of the magnitude of the symbols. Now, if you've been with me before, you know my place value pocket, but this book goes deeper. Oh, wait. Do I even need to crack the spine of it? I can get an awful lot out of just the cover. Tomorrow, one of the Make It Take It projects I'll talk about is my place value odometer. Here's the thing that's big about this picture. What are the children doing on the cover of the book? Miss Sutton, they're collecting cans. You're right. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to recycle those cans. You're right. They are. Uh-oh. Ding, 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 ding. Put a note. The reason this book will always be the top literature pick of mine is because place value is a hard concept for children made a little simpler with the analogy to recycling because base 10 means there are 10 symbols. What's the largest symbol we can write in mathematics? Oh, Miss Sutton, it would be a nine. You're right, it would be a nine. After that, there are no new symbols. So how do I talk about one more than nine? Well, it's a 10, Miss Sutton. Yeah, but think about the symbols that we use for that. 
Oh, you had to recycle the zero and the one. To me, I could teach my whole place value unit and never ever crack the spine, except once you crack it, you'll never go back because it is such a great book. I also want to mention a lot of the Stuart Murphy books in the Mass Start series are leveled. So they're level one, level two, level three. I don't think anybody is new to that concept. You'll see I have a lot of his books listed. I use a lot of his books. If you ever get a chance to hear Stuart, he is an absolutely great speaker. This is a really great place value book. But I wanted to bring you a couple of the books that are out that are also place value related. Another author you want to get comfortable with is David Adler. David Adler has written an awful lot of nonfiction math concept books. So they're not necessarily stories, but they develop concepts. The, I have um, his fraction books. I use a lot of his books. They're easy, grab and build your lesson around it. Put a note, it also is great with the work that you do with my place value pocket as a one, two, three, show me tool. This is his book, Ones, Tens, Hundreds, Thousands. His newest book goes much further. This is millions, billions, and trillions, understanding big numbers. Now, I'm not someone who is going to um, I'm not laughing about this, but I am not going to use uh, the data from this COVID experience with elementary children. Here's the thing, though. They hear and see really big numbers. Hard to conceptualize those really big numbers. Years ago, David Schwartz, the author of G is for Google, wrote um, a book called How Much is a Million? And then he followed it with How Much is a Million Dollars? Those are great books to develop that concept of big numbers. Hard to conceptualize, very standards-based. Again, going to refer to this. I'm going to sound like I'm speaking the standards. Every place we add is 10 times the magnitude of the previous place. So when you're talking about big numbers, we can't understand a big number before we understand really place value at a basic level. So in his books, he'll just get playful with a concept and try to develop Gee, what would a million actually look like? Because we write it with six zeros, but what does it look like? And then he goes into using sugar to represent a million. Slices of pizza, how many for a million dollars? Can you count to a million? Here's the thing about that. Big numbers are hard for all of us to understand it's always good to develop what are called reference points. I like David Adler's work because he does just that. He develops reference points for numbers. I also put, I mean, there's other books in here, but this is a new one by Seth Fishman, 100 Billion Trillion Stars. Can you imagine so many of anything? Great book, because again, we hear those numbers. Let me tell you a secret. The sun is just a star. Oh my gosh, Miss Sutton, how would you even read that number? Well, believe it or not, that number is 100 billion trillion. And that is how many stars, maybe, there are. Circling around our star is a planet that's green, blue and green. Oh, that's right, it's us. 
Blue because it's covered by 370 billion billion gallons of water. I mean, those are numbers that we have a hard time conceptualizing. Children kind of get filled with enthusiasm for really big numbers. And I always love when you're doing an example of this. And quite honestly, you get that response from students. Is that like infinity? Because they're trying to grapple with how big those numbers are. Now, I'm going to go a little bit out of sequence here and jump to um, a set of books that are at the very end that have to do with big numbers. And that is If the World Were a Village. If I were going to have um, third, fourth, and fifth grade this year, sixth, seventh, or eighth, I think I would probably start the year with this book. Because when you talk about those big numbers, it's hard to conceptualize the actual meaning, even in the reference to stars. This is an absolutely amazing book. I will tell you there are multiple editions of this book because as the data uh, has come out, we've, David Smith has updated this. Now, the author is David J. Smith. He is the author of the book, If America Were a Village. Also back in my first section, he did a book called If, and it's, it says a mind-bending new way of looking at big ideas and numbers. So it's kind of one of those books that supports that thinking and creates that curiosity in the class. This book blows me away. If you do not have my lesson plan for this, shoot me a note and I will send you the PDF of it and you will laugh. It is a 10 by 10 grid of dots. So keep that in mind as I give you an introduction to this book. How timely is this? And I have done this book where I do a two page spread a day because you'll see it's going to be something that they participate in. Oh my gosh, those chimes mean it's nine o'clock. Yeah, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> Welcome to the global village. Earth is a crowded place and it's getting more crowded all the time. As of 2014, now there is a newer edition of this book. I just didn't happen to grab it out of my classroom. The world's population was about 7 billion, 200 million people. Big numbers, hard for kids to conceptualize. Oh, wait, hard for adults. 32 countries have more than 40 million people. 12 countries each have 100 million people. China has over 1 billion, 300 million, while India has more than 1 billion, 200 million people. Numbers this big are hard to understand. But what if we imagine the whole population of the world as a village of just 100 people? So children have a 10 by 10 matrix of dots. So really, upper grade teachers, you are got the perfect lesson for fractions, decimals, and percents. Now, come and meet the global village. So I'm just going to give you what one two-page spread is like. So the first one is nationalities. The village stirs and comes to life, ready for a new day. Who are the people of the global village and where do they come from? Of the 100 people in the global village, 60 are from Asia. Now imagine they have that 10 by 10 grid. They're going to circle 60. If we talk about that as a fraction, 
and a decimal and a percent, you are looking at a picture of the world's population and you're saying more than half come from Asia. 15 are from Africa. And here's what's so silly about us in the United States. Children start to go, where are we? 10 are from Europe. Now I'm up to 85 of the 100 people. Nine are from South America, Central America, including Mexico and the Caribbean. Now the kids are like, what? Five are from Canada and the United States. Oh my gosh. You can feel how powerful the silence is here. One is from Oceania, an area that includes Australia, New Zealand, and the islands of the Southwest and Central Pacific. I love this because it's that book about perspective with numbers. Now, it goes on. I'm not gonna share the whole thing with you. You'll see a two-page spread on languages. This is the one that always gets us as an adult. A ball flies by and the children cheer. There are many children in the village. One fifth of the villagers are nine years of age or under. More than half are under 30. Raise your hand if you hope to live to an old age. That's right, I do. Here's the thing. <laughs> Look at this data, find your age or your family members. Nine of the villagers are children under the age of five. Nine are children between five and nine. 17 are between 10 and 19. 16 are between 20 and 29. You can tell we think in North America that we're entitled to live to an old age, but put it in the perspective of worldwide data, it's a very different message. I could spend the next hour talking just about this book. Great book, nonfiction, ties in those big numbers. Now, flip back if you would. I wanna mention a couple of books here there is a book listed under number sense called Equal Schmequal. This is one of the books I did as a read aloud um, on my YouTube channel. So put a little note by the book. This is, all I did was take the book and read it to the students using my document camera. So if you don't have this book, you could use that YouTube video and actually do the story with them. I also love this book because it's talking about the concept of that equal sign, meaning mathematical balance, not answer on the right. So this is one of the books that I did as a, as a read aloud. I also, have a lot of the circumference books listed in various parts of your bibliography. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but there are actually 10 of the titles in the circumference series. So I just sorted them by the content area of math. So you will see there's a book about rounding, circumference in the roundabout battle. You'll see there's a place value book. Again, I love Cindy Neuschwander because what she brings um, with her stories allow complex thoughts. And I didn't want to just feature primary literature. I wanted to bring in titles on more developed concepts. I also wanted to bring in a few chapter books. And this one is going to crack you up because you're going to go, oh my God, are you kidding? It was published in 1972. 
<laughs> yes, it was, people. But here's the thing. It's still in print. Most amazing chapter book you will ever read with your students. Gender equity, cultural diversity, the best problem solving you have ever imagined. And this is The Toothpaste Millionaire. It is this great story about, I mean, you could read the book and never talk about math and talk about everything else, but the math in it is pure gold. It is a great problem solving story. This young man, Rufus, meets a, a young lady who he is ends up in the same class with. And she actually had moved from a very rural setting to inner city. And first day of school, she is riding her bike and she has an accident in the middle. She cross, tries to cross the street. The bike gets in kind of an accident. She falls down, stuff goes all over. And Rufus, who she never had met, steps in and helps her. She noticed his book bags. And you can tell how much I love this book. And then they end up in the same class. And here's the funny part about it. She actually asked him about those book bags. He made those. He made the book bag. So he tells her what to buy, how much it's going to cost. And they strike up a very unlikely friendship. The toothpaste is a great story because Rufus gets sent to the store and uh, by his mother to buy toothpaste. And he comes back and he hasn't bought it. And she said, why didn't you buy the toothpaste? And he said, it's too expensive. I can make my own. So he tells that story next day in the classroom. And he turns to the teacher and he says, I think this would be a great project for us. So if you do project-based mathematics, this book, still in print, is the book for you. So I'm going to talk about... Again, I'm going to pick some titles and give you a sense of what they are used for and why I have listed them. So if you look ahead, again, another classic in the money section is Alexander Who Used to Be Rich Last Sunday by Judith Fiorst. Again, great book. Put a note next to that. That is great for solving, uh, making change on an empty or open number line. It's a great way to introduce that. When I did that kindergarten session, and my kindergarten teachers in Ohio said, Kim, we want to, do you know any books for subtraction with kindergarten? And I said, oh yeah, I do. My absolute favorite book for kindergarten first grade is a book that has been in print a long time. I think sometimes you judge these books by how long they stay in print. This is a classic. This is a great book because you can actually act it out. I have acted it out at virtual sessions since March, and I've seen the children who will duck down during a class meeting because the story, again, a little bit of the Danica McKellar one lonely spider sipped her tea while gazing at the sky. She watched the insects on the leaves and many flying by. If I had friends like these, she sighed, who'd stay a while with me. I'd sit them down on silken chairs and serve them cupcakes and tea. Two timid beetles, Ike and May, crept from the woodwork that same day. Now, I love it because we're adding on, so we have Miss Spider. Now we have two beetles. But when Miss Spider begged, please stay, they shrieked, oh no, and dashed away. So I first did this lesson in my daughter's kindergarten classroom, which is a long time ago. We acted out, I was recording on 
the board all the addition and subtraction equations as we acted it out. Now, make a note to yourself, there are two models for teaching subtraction. This book does the takeaway model and some people are opposed to those two words. Don't let those words bother you. Mathematicians call that the takeaway model. And I'm not trying to be funny here, but think about your bank account. What are you actually doing more than adding? You're taking away. The other model for subtraction, and I did do this as a read aloud on my YouTube channel. The other model for subtraction is that fabulous book, 10 Apples Up on Top. Put a note, the second model for subtraction is a comparison model. So it is the difference between. So what's the difference between the apples on the tiger's head and the apples on the lion's head? It's not a takeaway model. It is a comparison model. I'm, I'm here to tell you, I try to stay up on children's literature. This is the only book I have been able to find for the comparison model for subtraction. And I did do this also as a read aloud. You'll also see, and I did this at my first grade, just first grade math session. I just thought this book was so funny when it came out. Arithmetics. Get it? Get it? Get it? This is why I don't have any adult friends. You're not laughing. But kids think that's so funny. This is one of those great little stories to read. Um, I've read it as high as second grade with children because it does counting. But it also, as you go through the story, you will see um, representations of number bonds and 10 frames as children pursue addition and subtraction. So I love the story um, with children. My first grade teachers who attended that session got um, some game boards that go along with this book because in the story hidden in each picture is a little mouse so there's a, a kind of a cute little twist that i did with this book and a dice game using the chicks and the um, little mouse in the story that's a great one new one you can see it um, at the bottom of your second page that's a 2019 publication date. I also want to connect with you on some books about skip counting by multiples. Please understand that word multiple is so important for you to say. And there have been a lot of books out about skip counting by multiples, but there is a new book, and I did feature this at my just second grade math session, which those are still available on my website. We did film them. You can watch them. They each have huge handouts. This is the new book, Sheep Won't Sleep, and again, brought my little friend, my little sheep puppet to class. Here's the nice thing about this, this book. I love it because it connects that idea of thinking in groups of that originates originally by unit-based counting. Clarissa could not sleep. She tried everything, warm milk, reading, humming a lullaby, even, even her knitting. Counting sheep usually works, she thought. So she closed her eyes and pictured gentle, woolly, white sheep sailing over a stile with the perfect grace of ballet dancers. One by one, Clarissa counted them. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A loud bah made her open her eyes. And to her surprise, she saw 10 sheep in her room. It's not working, she said, watching the sheep, which had begun to get into her things. One ewe balanced on the bookcase with the lampshade on its head. You're not trying hard enough, advised the sheep. Try pairs of alpacas. Alpacas? Clarissa knew that pairs meant two, so she started to count by twos. Long neck, long legged alpacas leaped over the stile. Unlike the plain white sheep, their wool was as colorful as Clarissa's basket of yarn. Orange and lime green, magenta and yellow. Two by two, she counted. Now, I'm not going to read the whole book to you. All of a sudden, she ends up with alpacas. Then the suggestion is try llamas, but the llamas come in and she starts counting by fives. Here's the fun part. Every class I did this book with, children then drew these animals with all these patterns on them. I mean, it was pretty doggone cute. Then guess what happens? Yaks! Yaks are 10 at a time. So the book is a great way to talk about skip counting by multiples. Put a little note to the side. It is an absolutely great book to tie in my color-coded number line that is behind me because those colored dots represent thinking in those groups of. I also included in this section some of the other books on skip counting, and I'm just going to talk about a few. These are, again, this is by my friend Stuart Murphy. Love this book. Does the same thing as Sheep Won't Sleep because the transition into groups of becomes very, very amazing. And here's the best part. They end up drawing these lizards the rest of the year. So you can see they do grouping, then transitioning as you go through the power of counting in groups of, which again leads to the understanding of the concept of multiples. I also put Stuart's book, Tally O'Malley. And I, again, this is a great read aloud with students. Real connection to the correct way to tally to make those groups of five. And I will be talking about that in my next session when I talk about music. I also wanted to put a reminder to you in the multiplication and division section, Put a note by Amanda Bean's Amazing Dream. That book I did as a read aloud for introducing with second, third, and fourth, the two models for multiplication. One is repeated, ad repeated addition of like quantity. The other model is the area or array model with more emphasis on the word area. So this book has been around a while. I consider it a classic. Obviously, Marilyn Burns did too because she selected it as one of her brainy day books and she has ideas in this. So I did read this on my YouTube channel. There are a lot of books that have to do with multiplication. And again, I, I listed a few. I love Eleanor Pence's book, A Remainder of One. If you don't know this book, she started with 100 Hungry Ants, then she did Arctic Fives Arrive, and then she did a book called Remainder of One. Now, when you're introducing division, 
this book is extremely profound because as you read it, and I love the sound of this book, the story of Job might just well explain what happens to numbers when they must remain after division and they're left behind as lonesome remainders. It seems so unkind. You got it, people. Division is the quirky operation with whole numbers where you are going to end up with leftovers. The book goes on, down by an orchard of young apple trees. The sunshine felt hot about 90 degrees. So insects all scurried for any cool shade. From mushroom or leaf, they watched a parade. The 25th squadron marched past the bug crowd, bound and determined to make their queen proud. Now, look at my arms on the text here. Do you see the division frame? I love that because you can take a piece of lamin on this book and draw that division frame around it. I also want to remind you when you are teaching division, nothing better than an egg carton. You can actually frame it and you'll see the division frame. So the book goes on for different configurations of that 25. And it talks about that concept of division, which doesn't appear with addition, subtraction, or multiplication of whole numbers. So I love the book because it, you can get right into the conceptual understanding of division. I also put some fraction books in here. Um, great, great fraction books. Full House by Dale and Dodds. This is very introductory level to fractions. I love her as an author. If you look what other books she has written, she's done some really great books for children on math concepts. I also would recommend one of the things that happened when Charles Bridge started to publish a lot of books the quality of the stories is amazing. So if you look for Charles Bridge, you won't be disappointed. This book is great with my number line, color coded, to use for reducing or simplifying fractions. So this book ties in really well with that concept. I also put the book, Holy Cow. Put a note by this title. This book is one of my read aloud books on my website. So I already read this book on my website and it is just one of those fun books that gets children thinking. And the fractions are also representing, remember there are three models for teaching fractions area, set, and number line. So you can see that you're going to be exploring set models of fractions in this story, and you can just see it on the cover. So, great book. I also mentioned, this is a classic, Even Stephen and Odd Todd. And many of you will say to me, oh my gosh, you mention that book every time you talk about books. And I do. I did read that one aloud on my YouTube channel. Great book. That's not the only book about evens and odds. Um, and they're all good. I just happen to like Even Steven and Odd Todd because you can get kind of playful with that. But Doris Fisher, did My Even Day and One Odd Day. And those books <clears throat> look like this. 
and you perhaps have seen them in your book order. Just another way to view the perspective of evens and odds and to get playful with students with that concept. Biggest number property to teach is even and odd because it carries you through actual factoring with numbers. I also mentioned the book Patterns in Peru. Um, if you don't know this series, this is again by Cindy Neuschwander and she's the circumference writer and the amazing Amanda uh, Bean's amazing dream. She's that same author. She does great things. You will also see her listed in my geometry section with a book called Mummy Math. And then in my measurement section, Pastry School in Paris, which is all about volume. This book goes into algebraic T tables. These same two children appear in all three of those books. So it's a series. Scholastic picked them up and put the three books as a set that you can purchase. I like it because it moves children from repeating patterns into growth patterns. And I did put a book in that section on repeating patterns by Stuart Murphy. This one goes into that concept and you can see it behind me of an algebraic tea table as children go through an adventure and use a tea table for problem solving. So I love this book. I love it right at the beginning of the year to set the tone that your classroom be a classroom of pattern seekers. So they get comfortable with that. If you look, there is no way I can cover all the books on my list. I tried to give you some uh, introduction to some of the books that I think are powerful. The Measuring Penny, Mapping Penny's World, and It's Probably Penny, are the story of the Boston Terrier. This looks like a very primary book, but it talks about measuring everything that has to do with a dog. So it actually gets into all the areas that we have to teach for measurement. I will tell you another one of my top 10, this is a top 10 book, another book that is a top 10 book for me in measurement. Coordinate graphing on a Cartesian plane. This is the true story playfully told. So it's playful um, fiction oh, based on fact of Rene Descartes and the Cartesian plane that he created that allows us to talk about spatial orientation. So I always talk about that book because there's so much that you can do with coordinate graphing with that book. I just had my alarm go off that tells me I have to stop because we got another session at 10 o'clock, a different session. Here's the thing, people. I hope you will reach out to me. If you are wondering what book should I use to introduce a concept in math, ask me. I will give you my best advice on that. I'll share some titles. If there's some books that you would like me to read on my YouTube channel this fall to save you from trying to figure out how you can come up with the book, reach out to me and I will do that. I also wanna mention in closing, new scholastic book called You Wouldn't Wanna Live Without Math. And that talks about something that we all know. And I have this listed in the very first section of general math. And that is that math is everywhere. Any story that we can tell has some connection to some mathematics. So my hope is that you think of literature like a gift and you also think of math like a gift.
I'm going to sign off. Anybody have any questions for me they'd like to ask before we do that? We got a lot of people in the session. You're so nice. You say nice things to me. So some of you ask how I am projecting this. So in my virtual classroom, which is what you see behind me, this is my spare bedroom. I have um, a wall so I can display my math visuals, but I also am using a document camera. And I just want to mention this. I know these are really tough times and not every school is able to provide equipment for us. I had a disaster going with my original document camera. I had to stack it up on a huge high stack of books in order to make it work for virtual teaching. Then my husband said, you know, we got to fix that. So he researched what's the best document camera. This runs through my computer, people. It doesn't plug into electricity. It is powered through the computer. I love the clarity of it. Not been that happy this morning with the color of the screen, but I'm also in the coastal fog. It will get better as the day goes on. So that is a Hoover Cam Solo 8. If you have any questions about that, I think they run about $349. I'm not happy about us spending our own money, but good suggestion for you if you're looking for that. Anybody else have a question? I'm gonna sign out of this meeting. meeting. I will put the recording up this afternoon on my YouTube channel. I appreciate you attending a book talk. It's not like a normal Kim Sutton workshop. I didn't want it to be like that. I wanted you to hear about some books in some topics of mathematics. So I'm gonna sign off and then start very soon our new meeting on music. I wanna thank you again for coming and look on my, uh, website to see the latest calendar of new things that are coming. I got lots planned, people. A lot planned. Thank you.